Uh huh. As well. Yeah. Y'all yeah. had a beautiful vibe. Yeah, yeah. and that's what you got. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Awesome. Cool deal. All right. This one's silent. And that's one thing I wanted to, to see. Hmm. Let me know when you're ready, Dara. Yep, I'm ready. Man, y'all got all the stuff out. Too much for me. <laughs> <laughs> you don't do the smartphones. I got one. I don't use it. <laughs> I feel you. <laughs> I feel you. I, I must have a million text messages I never oh. read. Oh, okay. I said, okay. man, I don't need no text. Pick up the phone. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. All you're going to do is pick up the phone and we'd ask me, did I get it? That's right. That's fair. <laughs> That's fair. So I said, no, man. I don't know about that, that stuff. I hear you. I ain't got better stuff to do with my time. <laughs> I know that's right. I know that's no, right. No, now you're younger than I am. With me, I've, mm -hmm. I've been through a mill, so I... Nah, it's not sure. I feel you. Not, not the nah. vibe. Not the vibe. How about, how about email? How you feel about email? I get emails. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't read that for them, but I get them. <laughs> I'm getting a little better with emails. Okay. Okay. But if you, if you need Mr. Person, you got to pick up the phone. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Man. Yeah. Well, we are uh, gratefully on location today for our uh, Let Me Tell You About It segment for WBGO. And I uh, want to thank uh, the exuberant, brilliant Mr. Houston Person for letting us uh, crash in on him today. <laughs> yes, yes. Thank you, my friend. Thank you oh. so much. It was so good to hear you the other night. We've talked about it offline, but just such a joy in your playing. And we're both from the South. Um, you're from uh, Florence, South Carolina originally? Yeah, yep. Tell me a little bit, for those who may not know, how you really got started on the saxophone, because you were a pianist first, right? No. No, okay. I took piano lessons. Got it. As everybody did. Uh, piano was in every home when I grew up. Mm -hmm. uh, music was a part of, um, all, all families had some sort of musical instrument. And the, the children took piano lessons. So uh, mm -hmm. that's, that's how I wound up playing piano. But I didn't play piano. I wasn't a pianist. And um, I, I was into sports. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Which ones? Oh, all of them. If you're from the South, you're into sports. Right on. You know. Right on. Yeah. Football rules, though. Okay, 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 <laughs> okay. That's that's fantastic. But um, but I got saxophone mm -hmm. later on. Mm -hmm. My folks knew that I like, I love music. I'd imitate mm -hmm. the saxophone players. So uh, one Christmas they bought me a saxophone, and uh, I guess they never dreamed that I would take to it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, especially families, parents, they don't expect you, they want you to get a job. Fair enough. Uh, uh, and musician wasn't one of them. <laughs> <laughs> I hear that. I hear yeah. that. But like the, the, just the lyrical nature of your playing, you sound like you're singing. When you play the horn, you sound like Melody is first, sound is first, and you just let that take over the whole crowd. That's what I witnessed. Um, and I know the way you listened as a young person, that was probably crucial to the, the, the cats that you dug when you were first coming up. Who, who were some of those cats that you first heard that just knocked you out? Uh, well, my major, my main influence was Illinois Jacket. Uh, and uh, and all the rest of the guys, mm -hmm. everybody had something, and 
everybody back then had a certain uniqueness about their playing. You know, everybody didn't play like one guy. They, you know, they, they um, uh, you know, Lockjaw Davis uh, and all the R and B saxophone players, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because the lines crossed. It wasn't so divided like it is now. But back then, you know, you played gospel and and jazz and blues, all that stuff was interconnected. So, yeah, um, those R and B players were great, and and some of the great saxophonists were in R and B. Well, they all were: Harold Land, mm -hmm. Johnny Griffin, mm -hmm. um, Gene Ammons. They all were in that blues R and B thing that we that we have that uh yeah, I like those guys. Yeah, me too. Yeah, well that, too. that that's the era mm -hmm. of guys being really individual. You could tell each one of them. You know, that's so right. so everybody contributed some, you know, you mm -hmm. you had uh Hank Mobley, which Ooh. we always forget. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Wow. So, there were guys. Yes, sir. And there were guys everywhere. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And especially around the realms of uh, Texas and Oklahoma. <laughs> Texas tenors. <laughs> Oklahoma. Yeah, yeah. Because uh -huh. they, mm -hmm. they had this territory band. Like, mm -hmm. uh, Illinois Jacket worked those bands before he got started. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ernie Fields. Okay. Okay. He worked from what, the, the Houston line to Oklahoma. Okay. All up okay. through there. And I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. They up that line, but everything had migrat migratory. Um, patterns. Mm -hmm. like most of the guys from Texas, they migrated to uh, L.A. Okay. Okay. Yeah. You know, you take like the, uh, the Crusaders. Right. Uh, Ernie Andrews. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of those guys, they, they went west. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, Teddy Edwards. Mm -hmm. And... Then from New Orleans up, they went to Chicago, right. St. Louis, right up to straight up. Mm -hmm. and then you had those that went from the Carolinas, mm -hmm. Georgia on down, yeah. going coming to New York. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. So it was interesting. I, you know, we migrated. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you how you got to New York, but before I ask that question. I know you were in the service. Yeah. And you played with some amazing peers. Two of them I want to ask you about right now. Cedar Walton mm -hmm. and Eddie Harris. Yeah. When you encountered those guys back then, were they already playing like we know them to play? They were already playing that way. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. They were already. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And they just took me under their wings. Yeah, mercifully they, they took me. And they uh, taught me a lot. Eddie Harris would make me practice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was a great pianist too. Yes, sir. Eddie Harris. Yes, sir. And Cedar was also a great composer, all those compositions. Eddie Harris had some big composition. But yeah, they were they all were were there. They were in the army. I was in the Air Force. Got it. Okay. Okay. And, and you guys met overseas or no? Yeah. Okay. And we Germany? met at a club in Heidelberg, Germany called K fifty four. And that's where we would meet every weekend and jam and they would tolerate me. <laughs> Cause they were already playing. I mean uh -huh. also there was Don Menzer. Uh, Don Ellis. Don Ellis, yes, sir. Yeah, Sam Fletcher. Mm -hmm. uh, Charlie Hampton, mm -hmm. a wonderful alto player. He was the head of the Howard Theater Band. Mm -hmm. 
in Washington. He was there. So they'd be coming in and going back home, coming back home. But it was uh, great, but Cedar was there the whole time. So, mm -hmm. And then, uh, I mean, and they were really playing when, when they came back. Lex Humphreys was there. Oh, wow. Wow. And uh, so when they came back, they went straight to the professional ranks. I went back to school. Okay, okay. <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. Yeah. And you went to, uh, was it Hart School of Music yeah. in Connecticut? Yeah. Wow, wow. But I also spent time in South Carolina State. Okay. Yeah. Okay, okay. In fact, uh, I was looking at ESPN this morning. They were celebrating uh, historic, historically black colleges. Yes, sir. Yeah. So I had some of that experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I studied there with Aaron Harvey, who's with Tiny Bradshaw at okay. South Carolina State. Mm -hmm. Johnny Williams was in that band, the baritone saxophone player for Count Basie. So I ran across some wonderful people, wonderful guys who helped me mm -hmm. along the way. That's beautiful. Yeah. That's beautiful. Uh, so when did you decide that it was time to move to uh, New York and, and, and New Jersey, what happened? Well, when I was at Hart College of Music, mm -hmm. um, I studied there with uh, Stanley Aronson, uh, who was a wonderful man, and um, um, I was working bands with bands locally. And I met Johnny Hammond Smith. Wow. Uh, wow. He was moved to New Haven, so uh -huh. he had a nice band and uh, Spider Martin. Mm -hmm. uh, that was when all those little towns, big towns, everybody had jazz clubs then. Mm -hmm. And were they organ clubs, Mr. Person, at that point? Had the B3 club? Well, not, I wouldn't say organ clubs, I'd just mm -hmm. say clubs. Okay. Because uh, in Hartford there was a jam session and a great jam session. That's where I met Marcus Belgrave okay. in Hartford mm -hmm. uh, at the Elks Club. And they had a piano. And uh, Norman Macklin was the uh, house pianist. So I wouldn't say organ, but there was the organ groups were prominent then. Mm -hmm. Really probably you see those guys moving the big organ. <laughs> yeah. But it was it was a great time for music. A great time. And uh so eventually I went on the road with Johnny Hammersmith. Wow, wow. take me back to, to, to when he asked you to, to, to come out with him. How'd the conversation go? He he already knew you're playing. I'm sure he was um pleasantly amused and thought that, you know, you'd be the cat that would be the right guy for it. How, how, how did it go down if you can? Yeah, I don't recall? know. Okay. okay. I don't know. It just, okay. it just happened. Okay. Uh, it's, it's, it's funny how, you know, bands are assembled. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, Sometimes uh, somebody doesn't show up and the next guy, up. the same as in sports, uh -huh. you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, you sub, and then they said, well, man, hey, you sound pretty good. We'll just keep you, you know, so a lot of that, you know, a lot of that is incidental or coincidental. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I, I, I wouldn't actually know, you know. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm playing for less money. <laughs> <laughs> that happens right. in sports, too. That's okay. That's okay. That's okay. But yeah, you guys just had a just a beautiful sound. That's where I first heard you on record, uh, was on some of his records on Riverside. Yeah. And then eventually on Press. That was the first Press record Eagles. I ever made. Okay. It was on Riverside. Was yeah. Mr. Wonderful one of the yeah. Riverside albums of Joe Johnny Hammond. Man, you've been listening a long time. Well, I I'm, I might be a young guy, but I, I like to collect vinyl. And uh, you, uh -oh. you guys have touched me for all of my life and 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 really specifically 
Um, when I got you listening to Johnny Hammond, I had to know, hey, does Houston Person have any records out? And I would go to the record bins and I saw this label named Prestige Records. Yeah. And that's where I really found out about Prestige was through guys like yourself and, mm -hmm. Gene, and Gene Ammons. Mm -hmm. um, I got to ask you about Prestige. Tell me about uh, Bob Weinstock and Bob Porter. How were they to work for? How did they give you a shot to make your own record um, in you know the, the mid 60s when you got your own deal? Yeah. Well, I recorded there with uh, Johnny. Uh, I must have done about four or five albums mm -hmm. with Johnny Hamilton. So I was in Boston then. I had moved to Boston. Okay. And one day I was just sitting in the house. I, I didn't know what I was going to do. I said, well, I'm going to call Prestige and, and see uh, if they would give me a date. And not knowing, I said, all they can say is no. I just one of those moves that hit me right at the same, just at a moment. If I'd have waited another moment, I probably wouldn't have done it. I just picked up the phone and I called. And uh, Cal Lampley was in charge of a and R then. Okay. They just called me A&R then. Mm -hmm. And uh, I could hear them say it. Are you ready for a Houston person? And they said, yes. And they said, yeah, when can you, you know, be here? They set things up. Wow. And I, I went and did the date. That's amazing. It was just a spur of the moment thing. Wow. Wow. I always think about how many, well, to all of us mm -hmm. in life, how much, many, Coincidental things happen, you know. Just things you do out of the blue. Mm -hmm. Sometimes detrimental. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. But uh, they say your life changes in seconds, you know. Yes, sir. And that was it for me. And Bob Weinstock was the nice, nicest man. Um, he gave me, he stuck with me through the years, even after I left, he would wow. call me and wow. say, you know, just keep doing it, you, you know, encouragement. And then I, I even heard from his son, who I played his bar mitzvah, his bar mitzvah. Okay. And, uh, but, uh. After he sold the company, he still would stay in touch with me. Nice. Now, I wouldn't say every day. I mean, mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. every now and then he would just say, hi, and keep doing it. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Yeah. And they, he, and he just stuck with me. He kept. Mm -hmm. I, I couldn't believe it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm.